Greetings, I'm Dr. Joseph Caprini. I do general and vascular surgery in the United States and have run a research and clinical coagulation laboratory for a number of years. I was here last year at the invitation of the Chinese and had a wonderful visit and a very warm reception talking about the risk assessment score. And now I've come back at their invitation, which was very generous indeed, to help explain how to really use that score to implement it in hospitals and prevent venous thromboembolism. Well, the, the problem is that in, 2000, in, in 1986, diabetes and hypertension hadn't been statistically validated as true risk factors for thrombosis. And as time went on, more and more of these factors were associated with the venous thrombosis. But just imagine the problem. You've got 200,000 patients, you have 60 studies, all showing this clear correlation. If you start to put in other things, you're gonna to have to redo that. And how are you gonna come up with another 200,000 patients to match that validation cohort? So the simple answer to the question is, this risk assessment, which is rather straightforward, it works. Yes, are there other factors that are associated with venous thromboembolism that we have discovered subsequently? Absolutely. But the fact of the matter is that what we, what we can't really do is keep adding all of these things because it would get very much more complicated and by ri having the score rise higher, it may actually produce more patients with falsely elevated scores that may cause bleeding since it hasn't been fully validated. But if you take a look at the score, BMI over 25 scores a point, congestive heart failure, even if it's being treated, the patient has congestive heart failure as another point. So already there are some things in the score that indirectly reflect these uh, situation as di the diabetes and hypertension. So in summary, this is a simple scoring system that works. It's not a problem of the scoring system not working. The relationship between chemotherapy and venous thromboembolic disease is very complex. Now let's take a step back and talk about the cancer patient. Usually the cancer patient is older, has an operation, may have a central line or port for the chemotherapy, and may have other comorbid conditions. So that right away, the score is going to capture, uh, and of course, surgery as well. So let's take a person over the age of 60 is two, surgery is two, cancer is two, that's six, central line is two, that's eight. So we don't need to talk about chemotherapy in addition because what that score of eight tells us is that the patient's got a high enough incidence of venous thromboembolism to justify the use of anticoagulant prophylaxis for the period that the patient is at risk. This is probably one of the single most important issues of all regarding risk factor analysis and scoring the patient. Unfortunately, most of the time, the question about have you ever had a past blood clot including a thrombotic stroke, is not asked. Secondly, is there anybody in your family that's had a blood clot, a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or thrombotic stroke? That also is not asked. And the third question is, have you been told that there is anything wrong with your blood that might indicate that you're at increased risk for thrombosis, so-called thrombophilia factor? And I recently found an article in the Chinese literature documenting the importance of Chinese patients with a first degree relative who's had a thrombosis and that was a very strong factor for recurrent thrombosis. So that's the first thing, is the history and family history of thrombosis. And that scores three points right there, which is enough usually to take someone and put them into the high risk category. And for example, if you have a person that's 40 years old that's having a simple operation, uh, let's say a removal of a laparoscopic uh, ovarian cyst 
and it takes an hour. So you have over 40 is one. You have the operation, which is two more, that's three. But now if that patient's had a past history of thrombosis, that takes it up to six. If there's a family history of thrombosis in addition, that's nine. And if there's a history of a thrombophilic defect, that's 12. You can see how a relatively benign, simple procedure may be done in a person that's very high risk and they, they as a result, could die. So, what the problem is, and this is now, as a matter of fact, I've just finished reading the 2016 guidelines that have been written for China by the Chinese, and they clearly state that it is no longer appropriate to classify people according to the type of operation. And the reason for that is that these patients, like the one that I indicated to you, may have a simple operation, but be at very, very high risk. So that's an important issue. So you can see how that's very important to categorize the risks. The next thing is, and it's not, not quite as prevalent, but people don't score uh, physical examinations properly. They don't really examine the patient for swelling and use pretibial pressure or look very carefully around the ankles to see if the person is swollen, because that's a risk factor. Also varicose veins, they have to be bulging, significant varicose veins, not spider veins. So these are two additional things that are very often missed in the analysis. This is a very difficult issue. And of course, if you think about it, patients with advanced liver disease and cirrhosis, for example, or extensive tumors, often have a decreased synthesis of clotting factors, and that makes them more likely to bleed. And uh, in this case, I would like to uh, discuss uh, an article that I read recently about the incidence of venous thromboembolism after certain types of hepatic resection and the incidence of bleeding in those patients and the incidence of returning to the operating room. Now it turns out that overall for all of the hepatectomies, which would be left-sided or right-sided or extended right-sided, that uh, it was around 2.9, almost 3% incidence, but it was only 3% uh, incidence of, of venous thromboembolism, but only 7 tenths percent incidence of bleeding. So there was three times as much thrombotic events as, as there were bleeding events, and 4 tenths of the patients went back to the operating room. Now, th that, those figures held generally true for uh, left hepatectomies and right hepatectomies, but when the patients had an extended right hepatectomy, now all of a sudden the DVT rate jumped to over 5%, and the bleeding rate was around one, a little over 1%. But you can see with all of this, even with extensive liver surgery, the chances of blood clotting were much greater than the chances of bleeding. Now, bleeding is a nuisance. It's an embarrassment to the surgeon. It requires transfusion. Complications may occur requiring reoperation, but it very rarely causes a death.